Anybody remember when we talked through the tabernacle about praying through the tabernacle? What's the first thing you do? Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. We need to make up our mind to start doing that every time we come to church. Walk through the door if you have to. I've done it before, Brother Kendall. When I come in to pray, I crack the door, open it, lock it back, turn around, lift my hands up, Brother Pete, and come walking up the aisle saying, thank you, Jesus. Lord, I love you. I praise you. I truly, I don't want to just say enter into his gates. I want to do it. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. If you can this morning, and I, I didn't type up a paper, mainly because I was over yonder and it was wonderful. Thank you all so much for letting my wife and I go when we got the cabins. And it's, it's uh, a little slice of heaven as far as uh, things that you hold dear. And one of the things that I hold the dearest is peace and quiet. And uh, it's very quiet, very peaceful, and I certainly do feel refreshed and invigorated. Probably will need to go again about the first week in December. <laughs> nah, but it, it was fun. It was great. Uh, I, uh, I followed my wife around going in all of those stores and junk stores, and one mission store was locked up. Before we got there, they was closing, but... Uh, I stayed nice and sweet and congenial all the way till about 4 o'clock in the afternoon. That, my friends, is a miracle. I didn't start wanting to go home till about 4 o'clock, Brother Pete. I thought I did pretty good. I really did because I was ready to go a long time before that. Last Sunday, uh, I... Uh, I spoke about uh, the enemies come against a lot of us, right? Huh? And uh, any time, guaranteed, any time the Lord starts moving in somebody's life, that the devil jumps on them. Guarantee it. What we must always realize and never lose sight of is we win if we hold on. Giving up is not an option. Amen? Amen? Giving up is not an option. But this week, I was sitting here one morning praying, and uh, I, I really love the way that uh, my prayer life has evolved. And it's not something so super mystical anymore. Like, y'all know what I'm talking about, where, where you feel like your prayer time has got to be, you know, most heavenly, gracious, loquacious, magnanimous, you know, we, we worship thee. Like he's the only one we talk to in Bible language. Okay, thee and thou and, and stuff. But, Marcus, I sit here sometimes and I pray. And Brother Pete, the Lord will lay somebody on my heart. So I just stop, send him a text message. And sometimes Brother Kendall, he lays a passage of Scripture on my heart. So I just stop, open it up. Lord, what do you want to say? When prayer becomes communication, it's a whole new world. A lot of us just, when we pray, it's, it's monologue. Meaning I talk till I get done, and when I'm done, I zip up and go home. My Bible case. But communication, and I realize something. This week, the greatest weapon that we have against the power of the enemy is truth. He is a liar from the beginning. He's the father of all lies. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. John said, thy word is truth. He also said, you shall know the truth. Truth and the truth shall make you free. Jesus told the woman at the well. Am I blaring loud this morning? Boy, I, I've got something wrong with my ears. I feel like I'm cranked up 
20 times louder than normal, hurt my own ears every time I talk, whether the microphone's on or not. Jesus told the woman at the well, Brother Rods, that the time will come and now is when the true worshipers shall worship him in spirit and in truth. So, in recognition of the fact that truth has played, continues to play, and will always play a significant role at the forefront of a Christian's walk with God, that if the devil can change, distort, or slightly alter the truth and get you to believe it, he wins. Now, you hear me now. If the devil can take truth and change it a little bit, Brother Rice, you got to understand this about the Lord. It's either true. It's not First John says, hereby we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error, false, what's not true. Okay. You cannot be halfway true. If you tell a half truth, guess what you just told? It's a lie. If it's got any lie to it, it's not true. So if the devil can change this great glorious truth that the Bible speaks of so profoundly and so powerfully and get us to believe it, then the devil wins. So we, as we have been instructed by the great wise man Solomon in the book of Proverbs chapter 23, verse 23, we are to buy the truth and sell it not. We are to gain the truth. That's a poor rendering. You can't buy the truth with money. One man tried to buy the power to give people the Holy Ghost and Peter said, thy money perish with you. Okay, your heart's not right with God. You cannot buy, as far as money goes, the truth. But we have been given the truth and the ability to see the truth and to know the truth and the truth shall certainly make you free. The greatest truth, that is the launching pad, excuse me, the truth refers to the entire body of truths that make up the plan and the word of God. The greatest truth that is the launching pad for all who will endeavor to follow Jesus is to know who Jesus is. The greatest truth that you know is to know who Jesus is. The enemy has in the mind of many Understand this, just because it is possible, now I want you to get this, I wish I came up with it myself, but I, I didn't. Brother Cliff Readout from up in Connecticut, I heard him say it, I read it in a book. It is possible to believe a lie. It is impossible to know a lie. Now, think about it just a minute. You can believe something that's not true, but it's impossible to know something that is not true. You believe there's a boogeyman under your bed, but you cannot know for a verifiable fact that there is a boogeyman under your bed because there ain't no such thing as boogeyman. Huh? Say, well, where are you at? I, I, I just got to get down where we're real at. You cannot know something that's not true. John 1 and 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The enemy has in people's minds distorted the reality of who Jesus is, but we have to, by the Scripture, declare Him as He truly is. Not as we think He is, not as we feel He is, but as He truly is. That word, Word, W-O-R-D, notice it's capitalized. 
The beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. This, this message I have for you this morning very strongly hangs on us getting a true definition of what that means. It comes from the Greek word logos, or logos, L-O-G-O-S, which is God's self-expression. God's means of disclosing himself, or God speaking from himself, much like a man and his word. I give you my word. Now what did I truly give you? When I say I give you my word for something, what have I truly give you? The hope that I'm telling you the truth. It's God's word. In the beginning, the Logos was with God. Not as a separate person, but as God himself. It's the word, the self-expression of God. In the fullness of time, God put flesh on the Logos. He expressed himself in flesh. That's from Brother David Bernard's book, The Essentials of the Oneness Theology. But the Logos is... How many of you remember in, in, in school when you were told to write a story that came from your mind? Remember that? When you told a story. Some of you weren't asked to tell stories. You just did it all the time. The Logos is the plan of God in the mind of God. It's what God desires to happen throughout of all mankind. He is the what? Alpha and Omega. Listen, I'm going to teach this. I don't care who it hair lips. Every devil in hell. Because I realize through the unction and the power of the Holy Ghost that it's the truth that is the devil's greatest enemy. And the truth is, in the beginning was the Word, was the plan of God, was the mind of God, was the will of God. It was God declaring Himself, His thoughts, His idea, His plan. Verse number 2 says, The same was in the beginning with God. Notice the similarities to John chapter number 1 and Genesis chapter number 1. This is the introduction of a new beginning. The first beginning was the creation of the earth. The second was the creation of the church. With Jesus Christ came the church. The, the word church is ecclesia, which means called out. It is the vehicle by which mankind would complete the plan of God which was from the beginning. The church is the, the sanctuary. It is the building, if you will, and understand it's not this building, but it is the building that God has created that people, that mankind, through the preaching of the church, through the institution of the church, could enter in back to relationship that, that was, was destroyed by sin and the plan for restoration from the fallen state entered into by Adam and Eve. The church is the vehicle through which we go back to relationship with God, the one that he desires to have with his people. The church is the body of Jesus Christ. And the church is the vehicle through which we are restored to relationship with him. It's the church, the called out, the Ecclesia. We'll see more similarities to the beginning of creation as we read on in Scripture. John 1 and 3 says, All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. Him, God Almighty, Notice this, Colossians chapter 1, verse 16 and 17. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things, everybody say all things, were created by him and for him, 
And he is, bef- my God have mercy. He is before all things, and by him all things consist. Now, this scripture in Colossians is referring to Jesus Christ. John's scriptures are referring to God Almighty as described in verse number 1. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Okay. Next verse, 3. All things were made by Him and without Him was not anything made that was made. The Bible says in John that all things were made by Him and in Colossians all things were made by Him which is God and Jesus Christ. Now notice this. John chapter 1, verse number 4. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. Okay. In the beginning, somebody tell me, what does the first verse say? In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Then what? You don't have to go there, Brother Shannon. And God said... Let there be light. That's how it began, Brother Billy. Let there be light. In the beginning, in Genesis, the light and the darkness were separate. Night and day. In this beginning, the light and the darkness are separate as well. Jesus is the light. The light of the world. In the beginning... We, got to, we cannot lose sight. We cannot lose grasp that we're talking about the beginning. Brother McKinney, the beginning was when Jesus came. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth was the beginning of all of mankind. And in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. Was the beginning of salvation for all of mankind. Brother Robbie, bringing us back to where we were in the beginning with relationship with Him. In order for us to have relationship with Him, we had to have a new beginning. Notice verse number 5. And the light, that was Jesus Christ, shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. There's always been a separation between the light and the darkness. 2 Corinthians 4, 3 through 4. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. Lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. In the first beginning, the light was separated from the darkness by the spinning of the earth as it is today. In the second beginning when the advent, the birth of Jesus Christ, the step into the forefront of ministry with Jesus Christ, the separation is now unbelief. What separates the light from the darkness is a refusal to believe that he's who he said he is. There was a man, verse 6, Brother Shannon, John 1 and 6. There was a man sent from God. Everybody say sent from God. Whose name was John. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. He was not that light but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Boy, it aggravates me to death to have to go slow. John the Baptist was sent from God to preach the coming of Jesus Christ. That was his purpose for being born, Brother Pete, is to preach the coming of Jesus Christ. 
The plan was, Brother Rice, was that his message of hope would be received by everyone who heard it, and when they heard it, they would believe it. That was the plan. He was not that light. John the Baptist was not that light. He was to bring forth the message of the one who should come. The message of the true light, which was to be available to every man that came into the world. The true light was available. The only thing that can stop you from seeing the true light is unbelief. That light is available. The light of revelation, the light of truth to be able to see him as he is. Which was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. I'm going to get off into some tricky territory right now. There's not supposed to be 700 different ways to get to the Lord Jesus Christ. It was never meant, never meant to be, I got a neat idea, uh, just a, a neat thing came to me. It, it's amazing. You know, when we first started going to Walmart, it was a, a huge deal. It used to be over there behind Dairy Queen. And uh, they had just a little rinky-dink snack counter with the big red slushy. Do remember that big old plastic slushy thing that was on top of the slushy machine? Ices, I think's what they were called. Big old tall red one, they put a top on it, they'd fill it to the brim, and it was only red available, and then it got to be red and Coke available, and that was it. Huh? But Brother Billy, I was walking down the aisle at Walmart yesterday over at Poplar Bluff. And I saw, Roger, there was something that just spoke to me as I was walking down the aisle. I saw a whole center cap all the way down the middle aisle was nothing but them little throws. Y'all got them. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Them little blankets that, that we each need 50 of them to sit somewhere. Okay? But they had all kinds of different designs on them. They had snowmen and Santa Claus and wintertime and, and fall colors all down there. And then over here they had some with Duck Dynasty on them. And then they had some with baseball stuff on them. And you know what? Brother Rice, I realized, well, they got, they got a blanket for everybody that comes in here. They got a blanket that suits everybody's interest, that suits everybody's likes. And if you were as blind as the proverbial bat, all you're worried about is staying warm. But we have been indoctrinated to believe we got to get one that matches. We got to get one that's got something on it that we like. We got to get one that, uh, you know, that might fit the kid's bedroom. We got to get one to go with the right holiday. We got to get one with the right ball team on it. When at the end of the day, all they are is to keep you warm. And Brother Billy, I see there. How many churches you tell me was in Sykeston, bro? Over a hundred churches in Sykeston. They're all over the place. I, Roger and I drove down over behind Orsland's. There's a church over there I've never seen in all my life. I've been raised here all my life. There's churches everywhere. And they're springing up everywhere. They're starting everywhere. And it's all got a, 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 little, a little more of Burger King in it. which is have it your way. Huh? A different church, a different gathering will do it in a way that suits you just a little bit more. 
I, I tried to witness to a girl one time. I invited her to come to church. And, and I tell you, when the more that the Holy Ghost moves, the less this is happening to me. Okay? But it used to always be, I invite, especially a lady, I invite them to church and they say, oh, I, I might go there, but I ain't living like that. Now when I talk to people about it, Brother Bill, they don't even mention it anymore. All they're seeing is how, how much stuff's going on, how many people's going down there, how much excitement, and I got to come down there. That's what I'm hearing all the time. Nobody ever says anything about the way we look anymore. Huh? So, what has happened is people have taken religion, which is a belief system, and molded it and shaped it and formatted it to be an easy to use. When I used to go to Walmart back in the day, and we went to the mall at Sykeston back then too, and it wasn't the outlet mall. Brother McKinney, the, the options were fewer. Way, way fewer. But the options in this day have become more and more and more, just like it is with churches. And it's that mindset, please don't let me bore you to death. Please don't. But you got to see, do you have got to see the devil in it. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Do not go out of here and I say that I said every other church worships the devil. Because that's not what I'm saying. What I am saying is, is the devil puts a crazy thought in somebody's mind that changes what the word says to suit people. And before you know it, you've got a whole group of people that all believe the same thing. And it's not true, even though they are in their own way worshiping God, Brother Pete. But the devil, Brother Rice, is thrilled to death because they have been veered off, just slightly off course, of what God had originally intended for his people. So people, the devil has just... The devil has just given us what we want. And it is a verifiable fact. Brother Robbie, I'd, I'd love to get into it. I can't go into it. But it is a verifiable fact that every movement that has moved away from the Bible doctrinally also moves away from the Bible in lifestyle. It's a verifiable fact. I'm going to get Brother David Bernard's message from General Conference. I'm ashamed that I didn't get it. But he received a long letter from a, a huge pastor of another belief begging the United Pentecostal Church to not back down. You are the last strongholds, the letter said. You are the last holdouts. Everybody else has begun to preach, uh, the, b dilute their doctrine and change their lifestyle. Don't stop preaching holiness. Uh, don't stop preaching that there is a narrow way to salvation. Do not back down. Do not stop. Do not make the gospel user friendly. Do not. And the greatest weapon that the devil will use is try is to distort, misinterpret, or get our focus off of the fact of who Jesus really is. If he is, if he is made to be anything less than who he really is, the devil wins. Look at verse number 10. My goodness gracious. I, this was about the time I was starting to have myself a fit yesterday morning. He was in the world. The world was made by him. Brother Billy, how can anybody get anything else other than that Jesus was God? He was in the world. He made the world. They still didn't know him. Why didn't they know who he was? Yeah. 
I'm open for some answers. Why didn't they know who he was? He healed the sick. He raised the dead. He walked on water. He fulfilled biblical prophecy. Every one of them. Not just one, not just two, not just ten. Every one of them was fulfilled in the life of Jesus Christ. Brother Robbie, these biblical scholars that became bigots and snobs over their elite way of thinking and reading of the Scripture... And they still did not know who he was. Because he did not come as a have it your way. They were expecting a soldier. They were expecting a warrior. And they got a baby in a manger. Who came preaching love everybody. The Jews didn't want to love everybody. They wanted to love themselves and hate everybody else. That was the way they lived. They were snobs. But Jesus came preaching grace and mercy and truth. He came eating with publicans and sinners. He came touching lepers and hoochie mamas could come down and fall at his feet and he would forgive them of their sins. When the Israelites said, she's got to be dead, Jesus said, neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. He could not be the Messiah because he's too good to people. They had the audacity, Brother Shannon, to want him to wait till the next day to heal somebody because it was on the Sabbath. They said that. There's a whole lot of good days. Why you got to do it on the Sabbath? Because he told them later on when him and the disciples was eating corn, Sabbath was made for the man. Not man for the Sabbath. Besides that, I'm the Lord of the Sabbath also. Oh, there's some powerful message in there. This is my world. You're just living in it. It's what he said. Oh, my goodness. He was in the world. And the world was made by him and the world knew him not. In the beginning, Genesis 1 and 1 says, throw it up there. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. The first verse in the Bible. But John chapter 1 and verse number 10 just said, he was in the world and the world was made by him. And the world knew him not. Malachi 2 and 10. Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost up in here. If it wasn't so important that I get through this, I'd just have myself a fit right now. I know who Jesus is. Oh, he's so much more than just a story. He's so much more than so we get a couple days off from work. He's so much more than we get some presents. He is Jehovah. He is my provider. He is my peace. He is wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Malachi 2 and 10 says, Have we not all one Father? Hath not one God created us? Isaiah 44 and 24 I hope some of y'all taking notes. You are recording this. I expect you get a lot of orders for it. If they want it and ain't got a dollar, put it on me. Thus saith the Lord, thy Redeemer and he that formed thee from the womb. I am the Lord that maketh all things, that stretcheth forth the heavens alone, that spreadeth abroad the earth He was in the world, the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. God Almighty said, I did it by myself. John declared that Jesus was the creator of the world. The only way they didn't know him is because they refused to believe him. Remember, for unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given, 9 and 6 of Isaiah. And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called, help me. Come on, help me. 
wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. They refused to know him because of unbelief. He was there. He fulfilled scripture by where he was born, by where he was raised, by where he traveled as a child, and not the least of which, the mighty miracles he performed and the words he spake. They even, Brother Pete, they even said, we ain't never seen it on this fashion. Brother Rice, they also said, never a man spake like this man. And they still didn't know him. Say, well, I don't think it matters. I'll tell you what, it matters. Your, your eternity hangs on it. We've never seen it like this before. Never a man spake like this man. That's why, saints of God, you hear me right now. We can never underestimate the power of the deceiver. And his greatest deception is the blinded mind of the unbeliever. He blinds us from seeing who he is, who he was, and who he is the day to come. The Almighty. Verse 11. Now I want you all to listen to me right now before I move any further. I'm going over time this morning. I'm just going to change the time we get out from 11.30 to somewhere between 11.30 and 12 from now on. I've got a word from the Lord, and it's going to change your life. Say, well, we've been preaching so much, Brother, Brother Billy. We have been preaching so much about helping people feel better. We've been preaching so much about there's a better way and, and how to control circumstances and how to control the power of the devil. And brother, brother Terry, I have realized this week that the greatest offensive weapon we have, the greatest thing we can learn to defeat the, the enemy with is truth. And there's no greater truth than the revelation of who Jesus is. I'm so happy, sister. Is she out here still? No, sister Bobby Lynn, she go back there? I remember when Brother David and I were teaching Brother Boob and Sister Bobby Lynn a Bible study. We taught Monday night Bible studies for over a year and missed one Monday night in over a year. Every Monday night, they were there and we were there. But she just could not get the oneness of God. She could not understand it. And she was sitting in her recliner at the house one day trying to read the Bible. And finally, Brother Pete, she slammed her Bible shut and said, I give up. And as soon as she said, I give up, the Holy Ghost quickened to her mind. And then she said, I get it. I realize it. I get it. When you stop fighting and when you stop trying to reason it out and just accept him for who he is. And when you, and when you accept him for who he is, that's when he becomes all that for you. Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost in this house this morning. You'll know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. Brother Billy Israel, they were his chosen people. They were created by him for him. It was a people, Brother Roger, that he was going to put his name there forever. They were brought out of Egypt after being in bondage for 400 years. They were brought out of Egypt in order to receive a promise given to Abraham, which was a multiplied seed, which was financial prosperity, and a possession of all the land that he saw that day on the ridge looking out. When the Lord said, look as far as you can to the north, south, east, and west, I give it to you. And last but certainly not least, the greatest promise to Abraham was that in thy seed, that in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. That, my friends, was the body of Jesus Christ who was born of the tribe of Judah, of the lineage of King David, right out of the loins of Abraham. 
They were the ones that gave birth to him and received him not. Verse 12, but as many as received him, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. As many as received him, to them gave he the power. That word power comes from the Greek word exousia, I believe it is, which is ability. He gave them the power. Dunamis, I'm sorry. He to them gave he the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. The power, the ability to become the sons of God. There are so many in our world that have such a skewed view of grace. I believe in grace. I believe that we don't serve a God that's looking to cut our head off for every mistake we make. That's the devil. The Bible says neither is there... Well, Excuse me, not that one. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit. If you mess up and your heart's right, you're pursuing God and you mess up and something jumps on your shoulder and starts damning you and condemning you, rebuke it in the name of Jesus because it's not of God. It's not of God. And furthermore, if somebody else starts rebuking you and damning you and condemning you, rebuke them in the name of Jesus because they ain't of God either. Ooh, I went there. Yes, I did. To them, he gave power to become the sons of God. The ability to become the sons of God. Ladies and gentlemen, all grace does. All grace does is it opens the door. Grace gives you the opportunity that we once didn't have. And the only reason we have that is through Jesus Christ. I got into a discussion with a lady the other day that was telling me you get saved and then you get baptized and then that's it. They don't believe in the Holy Ghost. Though the gospel is the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. To them he gave grace. He gave power to become the children, the sons of God. Verse 13. Which were born... Those that he gave the power, the ability to open the door, which were born, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Born of God. What does that mean? John 3 and 3 says, Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. John 3, 5, and 6 says, Jesus answered, this is a different verse, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. I'm running the aisle in fat boy mode. That which is born of flesh is flesh. but that which is born of the Spirit. Brother Mark, I'm glad when I got saved that it wasn't just a decision I made, but the heavens opened up and the power of God was poured down inside of me and he that believeth on me as the Scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Something happened to me when I got the Holy Ghost and it wasn't something the preacher did or signing a card or making a good decision. It was the power of God Almighty that came down inside of me. My God, have mercy. Born of the Spirit. 1 Peter 1 and 23. Does anybody remember what word in John chapter number 1 means? Logos. 1 Peter 1 and 23 says, Being born again, not of corruptible seed, that's fleshly, but of incorruptible, by the word of that, my friends, comes from the Greek word logos. Just like John chapter number one. I was born again.
by the living word, by the plan, by God. Brother Billy, I was born again, and when I was born again, it was God expressing himself through me. No, 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 no. Boy, that's one of the weakest amens I've ever had and one of the most explosive things I have ever said. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. And I've been born again by the Word, by the Logos, by God expressing himself through me. I, I, I don't have this in my notes, but you've got to get this. Now, when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Acts chapter 2, verse number 1 through verse number 4. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it set upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. No, 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 not yet. And began to speak with other tongues. No, no, no. As the Spirit... As the Spirit gave them a trance. As the Spirit gave them a trance. Brother McKinney, that ain't something I make somebody do, that I tell somebody do. I can't do it. It's the Spirit of God Almighty. It's the Logos. He was in the beginning, and He's there in my beginning, at my new beginning, at my new birth. Let me tell you something. Verse 14. And the word, the plan, the self-expression of God, God uttering himself was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The Logos was made flesh and dwelt among us. In Acts 1 and 21, when they were determining Judas's replacement, the disciples laid down the requirements for the, for the replacement. Notice the description of what he had seen and who he must have been with. Acts 1 and 21. Wherefore of these men which have companied with us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out... And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. The prerequisite to replace Judas was you had to have been there when he dwelt among us. Why is that, Brother Billy? It couldn't have... Oh, God, have mercy right now. Judas betrayed him. He went and got hung himself and got buried in a field of blood. And when they decided, Brother Kendall, for a replacement, they had to make a decision. And the, re the replacement had to have seen him and been a witness to the resurrection. Yeah. No, didn't get that either. I'm doing a terrible job today. It can't be something somebody told you about. It can't be something you heard about from somebody else. It can't be something you just read in a book. But it's got to be something that happens to you. You've got to be a witness. Don't nobody, don't know we used to play freeze tag. And if you couldn't get to the base, you just had to touch somebody that was on base. Uh, get a contact. You can't do that. You've got to be a witness to it, and you've got to be a witness to it for yourself. And I don't care how many devils come against you, how many powers of hell come against you, or how many circumstances in life come against you. There is not enough power in heaven or hell to take it away from you. Amen. Say, oh, you talk about it all the time. I certainly do. Oh, I certainly do. Brother Eugene, that's why I love that song. I love it so much. Every time you sing it, you're going to have to sing for me again pretty soon.
Because I was there. I was there. And Brother Pete, I didn't conjure it up. I didn't dream it up. I didn't fake it. It was the Spirit of God. And the power of heaven came down. And the book of Ephesians says, I don't have this in my notes either, but the book of Ephesians says, Brother Billy, that he hath raised us up and made us to sit in heavenly places. The Word was God. The Word was made flesh. John 1 and 15. I got about three more verses. John bare witness of him and cried, saying, This was he of whom I spake. He that cometh after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. Not as the pre-existing Son, but as God Almighty. With his humanity being the Logos, or the plan of God. He that cometh after me, Jesus, was six months younger than John the Baptist. But John the Baptist said he was before me. The only way he could have been before him is to be God Almighty. 16 and 17. And of his fullness have all we received. And grace for grace. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Verse 18. No man hath seen God at any time. The reason is, Brother McKinney, God's a spirit. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father. Now, God's a spirit. He don't have a real bosom. This is spiritually speaking that Jesus Christ came from the heart of God. No man hath seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. Give me Matthew 16, 13. Brother Shannon. When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And he saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is the Spirit of God. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. The word Peter does not mean rock. The word Peter means a small stone. Peter wasn't the rock. The knowledge of who Jesus was or who Jesus is, is the rock that the church is built upon. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. That's the Greek word ecclesia, church, which means called out. It's not kuriakos, it's ecclesia right there. Called out, separated, different. Not like it. And Brother Billy, he didn't call me out to have it my way.
And upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The gates of hell does not symbolize actual gates. It is symbolic of the wiles, the mindset, the conniving of the devil and his angels. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I remember daddy preaching a message years ago. The Bible does not say the gates of hell will not come against it. It says the gates of hell will not prevail against it. The gates of hell are coming after the church. And they will try to destroy it by the rock upon which it sets. Which is the knowledge of who Jesus Christ is. And, Peter, and Jesus said to Peter, I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. The church of Jesus Christ is built upon the knowledge of who he is. He's not apart. He's not beneath. He is not the second person of no trinity. He was God. The enemy has tried to minimize him. Let's stand. Try to minimize him, misinterpret him, distort him to in effect, Brother Billy, the enemy has tried to divide him. But we have a sure word the Bible gives us. As of a light that shines into a dark place. Colossians chapter number 2 verse number 9 says, For in him. God help me. For in him, Brother Pete, dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead. The creation. The incarnation. The death, burial, and resurrection. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Next verse, and I'm done. And ye, you, Brother Billy, it's impossible to be complete in a partial, to be complete in an idea, to be complete in a thought. Or in another way of putting it. And ye are complete in him which is the head of all principality and power. Amen. Say, well, there's a whole lot of stuff that you didn't touch on. You're exactly right. You're exactly right. I doubt any of you brought your dinner with you today. But Jesus declared it emphatically, Brother Billy. Before Abraham was, I am. Jesus was God manifest in the flesh. The Bible explicitly declares he was in the world. The world was made by him and the world knew him not. If you want to be saved, fill with the Holy Ghost, make heaven your home. A prerequisite for doing that is to know who Jesus is.